This episode is supported by Army Reserve Officers Training Corps, the college elective for undergraduate and graduate students that provides leadership training for success in any career field. If you have a passion for it, you can find a place to fit in the Army as an officer and get the training you need to turn that passion into a career. It offers merit-based scholarships that can pay up to the full cost of tuition and open educational opportunities. Whether you are in high school, college, or already in the Army, are you ready to become a leader? Enroll now! To receive more information about the Army ROTC program, visit goarmy.com slash podcast. This is Data Science at Home, the podcast that makes machine learning and artificial intelligence easy for everyone. Here's your host, Francesco Garaletta. Thanks for tuning in and uh, welcome to Data Science at Home podcast, where we talk about technology, machine learning and algorithms. Today's episode will be about programming languages and data science. Python, as many know, is the de facto standard in uh, machine learning. There is a large community, a large choice in the set of libraries at the price of less performant tasks sometimes, but uh, it's a pretty decent language for uh, the tasks of, uh, of data scientists. I'm uh, with uh, Rebecca Bilbro, co-author of uh, a very interesting book, Applied Text Analysis with Python, uh, that has been uh, written together with uh, Benjamin Bankford and Tony Oyeda. Hi, Rebecca, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm good, and I'm really looking forward to this episode. So do you mind introducing yourself to our listeners? Sure. Um, Well, I am a professional data scientist. I live in Washington, D.C., and I lead a team at a small technology contracting and consulting company here. Um, So the team's focus is really on um, building features uh, for client applications using applied machine learning and natural language processing. I've always sort of um, enjoyed working in that space between natural languages and formal languages. Um, As an undergrad, I double majored in math and English. And then in graduate school, I studied communication and visualization practices and engineering. So after I finished my PhD, I came out to D.C. So that was in 2011. And that was really just when data science was starting to take off. Um, And I happened to have a job uh, analyzing some very messy data um, and was sort of uh, struggling to come up with tools that would help, you know, a lot of the proprietary tools that we had in my organization, we're just not cutting it um, for the kind of wrangling work I needed to do and the kind of customized analytics I needed to do. So I taught myself Python and started kind of building my own solutions. And eventually that sort of became my full time job. Well, today's episode will be about language and computation, as we as we said. And um, it's kind of uh, um, a very well known fact now that uh, today's products and uh, and services are more and more based on language and, for example, NLP, natural language processing, and uh, and, and all that stuff. So no matter what the expectations are, um, I've heard enough people shouting at the Google Home or, or the <laughs> Amazon Alexa. Uh, many others are texting to basically algorithms, uh, so-called chatbots, on, on kind of on a daily basis. Now, my question is, how did machine learning for consumer products change in the last 10 years? Um, That's a good question. I think, you know, it's a couple of things that all happened sort of at the same time. Um, So a lot of the tools that are sort of critical to building machine learning based products sort of became available all within a few years of each other. So part of that puzzle is sort of the distributed computing part of the puzzle. So um, Hadoop in 2006, um, you know, was available um, and people started kind of hacking on it. Um, And, you know, a a couple years later, there was sort of like the NoSQL revolution, um, which made it possible to store, sort of easily store the kind of data that was needed to build kind of interesting uh, machine learning based uh, consumer products. Um, And then, you know, just around that time, there was sort of a revolution in machine learning software. And I'm thinking like, particularly from the Python perspective, in 2010 is when Enria open sourced uh, scikit-learn. And so all of a sudden kind of the, the sort of perfect storm of tools was available. And because they were all open source, 
they were not only available, they could be sort of easily made to integrate. And so those integration points um, kind of spawned this like development of another generation of open source libraries that kind of connected all the pieces together and made it, you know, easy to do machine learning in a robust way. I think the other part of it is that it sort of became like an expectation the consumer, you know, we sort of expect things to be tailored to us. So my co-author, uh, Benjamin Bangfort, talks about this in his his previous book, um, which is about Hadoop. Essentially, what he says is, we entered the age of the data product. Um, you know, so what that means is that everything we were doing was generating data, and the companies providing services and products to us started figuring out how to use that data to customize our experience of what they were selling. And, you know, that sort of created this new sort of market. Hmm. That's a very nice overview of uh, of machine learning and data science in the last probably you know, a bit less than 10 years. And then we had language modeling, which is the most challenging of all. So, I mean, there are many reasons why I'm saying that because, well, first of all, uh, language is dynamic and uh, unstructured with respect to uh, some more established numerical problems. Now, how is this impacting the way people do research and how does this affect the tool that researchers work with? That's a that's a good question, because I think that there are sort of a you know, we want to distinguish a few parallel tracks of natural language processing. So there's a couple of communities inside of, you know, inside of the space um, that are kind of doing things a little bit differently. And we should probably kind of distinguish them a little bit. One of them is you know, the computational linguists. Um, so they've been, you know, when you when you say language modeling, like we're really talking about what computational linguists do, and they've been, you know, doing this for decades. You know, th- this is all about kind of um, thinking about models as in terms of n-gram probabilities um, and building them is really tough. Um, you know, like you said, because language is dynamic um, and so you need a lot of data. Um, um, in order to sort of capture um, what things mean. Um, and in order to do that, it takes a really big engineering effort to manage like smoothing and back off for n-grams because you, ha- you have to hold all of those n-grams in memory in order to kind of make an application run on that kind of language model. Um, on the other hand, there's like the AI engineers. Um, they are kind of approaching language really differently, right? So they, they aren't thinking about modeling language directly but they're thinking about kind of using these sort of really complex neural models that try to learn the, you know, non-sequential relationships between the little bits of words and the, and the things that we say and that we write. And that's really promising because, you know, like we said, language is really complicated. You know, the like meaning isn't always sequential, but that approach is really hard to be successful at unless you have a whole lot of training data. And, you know, not everybody kind of has... Um, enough data to to make that successful yet, although that that will probably change. Um, but and, and there's this, and, the, and these guys are usually those who are annoying the computational lingu- linguists. Yes, I have saying... noticed. <laughs> there's a, a little <laughs> there's a little friction there uh, between the two communities. <laughs> but I think I would personally put myself in like a sort of a third a third track, which is really not research based. You know, it's commercial and. For me, my target outcome isn't kind of a perfect language model. It's something that's just a useful feature for for my client. And so what that means is, you know, I'm not really worried about building a model that has like really, really, really low perplexity, um, you know, so that, you know, I need like a a million, you know, millions of n-grams or that, you know, produces like the highest possible F1 score for for sentiment. You know, I um, in the book we say that, you know, applied text analysis is really less about um, algorithmic innovation. You know, it's about applications. It's about spotting interesting problems in the wild and then making small, little, you know, but really high value features. So building those useful features really comes down to focusing in on a specific domain problem and then using a domain specific data set to come up with a solution that makes your user's life a little bit easier. Right. And that's the, I think, the, the most challenging task of all, which is finding, uh, finding enough data. Uh, now, this is quite the case in, uh, in numeric uh, machine learning problems. Is it still the case you know, in, for, for, for language modeling? Even today, when we have uh, uh, a lot of chats, a lot of text that is produced every day. Now, how do researchers and practitioners deal with this, uh, let's say, lack of data? 
Yeah. Um, so a lot of people kind of use found, I call them found data sets. Um, you know, so these are data sets that, um, you know, somebody else put together and that you're leveraging for kind of your problem. Um, and, the, you know, the Wikipedia data set is sort of the, the classic example um, for, for text. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I'd say is that it's really not a problem of like not enough data because, the, you know, the Wikipedia data set is massive. Um, but it's more like a problem of it's not enough of the, the kind of data I need for my specific problem because you you can't it turns out you can't really build a useful feature for a domain like, you know, medicine or law or something using a model that's trained on all of that Wikipedia data, because even though it's big, it's just really general. So it, it knows a lot about a lot of uh, or knows, you know, a little bit about a lot of different things, but it doesn't know very much about what doctors do all day or what lawyers say to each other all day. And so useful features really need to be trained on domain data. And sometimes finding enough domain data um, is hard and you have to, you have to build your own data set. The other thing is that like the, it can't be sort of a one way thing. It can't, you can't um, treat it like a static problem where you have a data set, you train the model and it's done. You, you know, you need to build the application to, to create a feedback loop so that the application isn't just generating predictions and giving answers, but it's also ingesting feedback and it's ingesting more data um, so that the application knows when it's wrong, um, so that it can, can learn and so that it can evolve that the underlying models can evolve over time as the as new data comes in. So if you ask a data scientist what is he or she doing, uh, they most likely answer, we are looking for features <laughs> almost all the time. So feature engineering uh, is one of the most creative yet effective tasks before jumping on any classification or regression problem. How does it work with text? Well, I... I... First, want to say I 100% agree with you. I mean, I think that um, I really like the way you said it. That feature engineering is, you know, incredibly effective, and it's also a creative sort of effort. It's it's that part that's maybe the hardest to automate, um, you know, of all of the pieces because it really takes a lot of kind of interactive, creative work. With language, though, it's really hard because so the features, you know, when you're talking about feature space with language, the features are mostly words, right? Or, you know, sometimes we call them tokens to kind of move them a little bit away from kind of how we think about, you know, language um, just as a utility for every day um, and more as, you know, as data. But, you know, it can also include things like metadata, like who wrote the text or um, where it was published or, or whatever, where it was collected from. The problem is that you know, we use language every day. It's, it is, it's a utility. And so tricking yourself into, you know, seeing language as data is hard because our brains try to interpret the words. Um, and we try to interpret them using whatever cognitive filter we have that we've accumulated. And when we do that, we unintentionally inject bias because, you know, we, we want to think that the words have meanings that they don't have. So, you know, um, the example I was thinking is that like, you know, when you think of the word ugly, that sounds bad. But, you know, when you're watching David Chang's TV show and he calls a plate of noodles ugly delicious, you know, that's a good thing. He means it. It's a it's a compliment. Um, so it's easy to lose that context during the feature engineering process. If you aren't careful, it's easy. Like if you throw ugly into a bag of words, you know, you lose ugly delicious. You lose that nuance. You lose the context. Um the other, um, the other issue with text um, in, in terms of feature space is that text makes a really, really high dimensional feature space. Um, and some of the features are more important than others, um, you know, and, and it's hard to uh, determine uh, what those feature importances are. It's less straightforward with text. Um, so it's, a lot of times you have to use, you know, kind of intermediate techniques like maybe topic modeling um, to extract themes and try to figure out, you know, themes that could be used as features to train, you know, a classification model downstream. You know, the other thing is that text is really sparse. So it's really, really high dimensional, but um, it's also really sparse. So that just kind of becomes computationally challenging at some point. Um, and so a lot of models suffer. But, you know, the other, <laughs> the sort of flip side of this is that, you know, it, this is all kind of with the more traditional machine learning 
you know, if you ask the deep learning folks, you know, they'll, they just say, um, just let the network, you know, learn the features, <laughs> um, which is, you know, that, it, that is another approach. Right. Yeah, provided they have enough data, of course, because usually these models right. are extremely, are, are bloody hungry. <laughs> they are very hungry. <laughs> All right. So, well, let's speak about a very well established pipeline for text analytics. Uh, more specifically uh, to in the text analysis, what are the steps data scientists take, uh, you know, starting from data collection to, let's say, uh, text classification, for example? Um, so I, I'll start by saying that I think that when I think about like a workflow for machine learning, um, whether the data is text data or, or not text data, if it's, you know, numeric data or image data or whatever, you know, the, the core of the pipeline really is the model selection triple. So this idea of the model selection triple comes from this paper um, on model selection management systems by um, a guy named Kumar. Um, it came out a couple of years ago. And it's really about, you know, next generation databases that anticipate machine learning kind of from the start. But what he says is that model selection is about a lot more than just kind of picking the right algorithm. There's that feature engineering, feature analysis part that we were just talking about. And then there's also hyper parameter tuning, you know, trying to optimize the, the parameters for the model, you know, to get the, the best performance. And so really that, that's the core. Um, that's sort of the heart of the, the analytics pipeline, the machine learning pipeline. And so what needs to happen is that the rest of the parts of that pipeline need to be as supportive as possible for iteration through feature analysis, model selection, and hyperparameter tuning. So for example, what that means is when you do ingestion, um, you need to plan ahead. Um, you need to organize the documents in a way that will make it easy to do um, seeking and sorting and filtering, because those are things you'll need to do when you're doing, you know, cross-validation later on and, and um, doing train and test splits. Um, so you have to kind of plan ahead to support that model selection triple. Um, another part of that that we talk about in the book is pre-processing. So um, you know, we sort of sort of think of pre-processing in terms of you know breaking the text down in a way that preserves the context. So you break it down into the composite parts. You do part of speech tagging so that you understand how the words were functioning, um, or, you know, in the sentences in which they appeared. The the trick though is that that pre-processing work is not just time-consuming; it's irreversible. You can't undo that, um, and it. It actually makes the corpus bigger when you add that, you know, those tags. Um, so you really need to, to plan ahead that um, you need to keep the original data in some kind of worm storage, you know, write once, read many storage. And the pre-processing work needs to be separate um, because, you know, if you later realize that you've pre-processed it in a way that threw away some of the information you needed, um, you need to be able to kick off another another pre-processing run that, that preserves that important information without having to collect the data all over again. If I remember well, uh, there is Spacey, which is a package that has been designed to keep this, exactly what you're saying, this separation and uh, maintaining the original version of the, of the text and separating the, you know, ingestion, pre-processing and vectorization eventually. Um, uh, that separates the two and, and without destroying the original, uh, the original data. Yeah. I mean, it's really critical. Um, you know, especially you mentioned vectorization, you know, there's a lot of different ways, um, to do vectorization and you honestly, it's hard to know in advance, which one is going to work best because you don't know which model is going to be the most performant yet. And you don't want to have to be locked into like, you know, if you pick one hot encoding, um, you know, that means that later on, if you realize that your model needs to be good at finding, you know, similarities between documents that don't share the same words, but share the same themes, that's going to be really hard with one hot encoding. And so you need to kind of make sure that those steps are uncoupled um, from each other so that you can do, a, you know, different iterations with different versions of um, vectorization with different um, algorithms to see, you know, what the best com combination is combination really is. I think, you know, finally, you need to um, kind of make sure that you're, you're storing the model. So when you 
um, have come up with, you know, the model that you like the best, you, you know, you've tried all of them, you've compared them, you've visualized them, you've tuned them. Um, it's important to serialize the model, you know, pickle it, um, or, you know, ser- serialize it in some way in store and version, version it. So they need to be version controlled, just like the code. Um, and you need to store the metadata so you under, you know you know what the the hyperparameters were um, you know what what pieces came together to to produce that optimal model right is there any tool that you would like to advise for each of the steps that you just mentioned in the pipeline yes so um, the one that we really tout in the book is pipelines so scikit-learn pipelines um, make that really easy to do. It makes it really easy to sequence those steps um, in a way that's robust um, because you can treat a pipeline like a model, like an estimator. Um, you can fit and predict it, um, but it can contain a bunch of different steps where you know, you're know you doing vectorization um, in different ways, um, or maybe you're vectorizing some of the components of the text in some ways, vectorizing the titles you know, using um, one hot encoding, but vectorizing the the text using some kind of distributed representation, for instance, you know, the the pipeline sort of makes it easy to orchestrate all of that. Um, And because it makes it easy to orchestrate that, it makes it easier to modify and it sort of encourages experimentation, which means that you're more likely to get to the, you know, to an optimal model. So my second suggestion would be yellow brick. Um, So uh, scikit Yellowbrick is a um, a library for visual model selection and diagnostics. So it's a Python library. It's open source. It's built on top of the Scikit-Learn API. Um, so you know it, it essentially has estimators and transformers, just like Scikit-Learn has estimators and transformers. But in Yellowbrick, um, you're uh, doing like a, a visual model estimation. You're picturing, um, you know, what's happening to the data as it's being modeled um, and what the performance is, um, or you're seeing kind of how the mo- the data is being transformed um, visually. You know, if it's being, um, if it's if the dimensions are being reduced, or um, you know, uh, for example. So, being able to do visual diagnostics um, really uh, helps to figure out which combination of um, steps is is working and is working the best and and kind of giving some insight into why um, why they're working better than other combinations that's really helpful interesting i will report both of them in the show notes of this episode of course Uh, now uh, context aware text analysis this is probably something that uh, uh, sounds familiar Uh, at least to you, because there is an entire chapter uh, dedicated to context-aware text analysis, which I personally enjoyed. Um, And uh, it seems to be the most advanced form of analysis for a machine learning, for a machine or an algorithm. Now, uh, when data scientists realized the power of n-grams a few years ago, they thought, all right, we crack the problem. (laughs) We crack the language problem because we know n-grams and we know how to compose characters or words and uh, we can classify all this stuff. Now, with deep neural networks, we have seen another way to classify or analyze text uh, that is more based, for example, on uh, pre-trained word embeddings and uh, uh, and other uh, components that are more, that are closer to the way, let's say, biological brain works. Now, how did the advent of word embeddings affect uh, context-aware text analysis? So I think it really, you know, it really comes down to the complexity of language, you know, that um, these new approaches um, are are very responsive to how complex language actually is in practice. And word embeddings can be a really, really effective way to encode context um, you know, which, like, as we've said, it's really hard to do that with bag of words, um, you know, even if you add n-grams on top of that, you know, because you have to, you know, you have to do all that work of engineering the n-grams, then you have to um, kind of hold them all in memory. Um, and so Thomas Mikhailov's word to vec and then Redeem Rehorik's subsequent work on GenSim um, have been really, really influential in the Python NLP community. Um I also really, really like uh, Richard Socher's paper on semantic composition- compositionality. So I don't know if you've seen that one, um, but 
you know, essentially what he's doing is he's doing sentiment classification. Um, but what he's done is you know, he's, he's using word embeddings here. Um, and, and although the, the implementation is really complex, you know, it's really intuitive when you look at it. So he's, he's doing sentiment classification of movie reviews and you can see the, the phrases are broken down um, and you get sentiment classification on a per phrase level, right? So you can see how um, these phrases can be classified independently and then how those pieces come together to form a complete utterance. That can a phrase like, you know, hearts of gold by itself gets classified as positive you know, out of context, but in the context of the review, which the full review, you know, for an example is you'd think America would have had enough of plucky British eccentrics with hearts of gold. So you see in the context of the review, you know, when you add up all of the pieces of the parse tree, it's actually meant in a sarcastic way um, because sentiment isn't additive necessarily. And what you get with wording embeddings is a way to capture that complexity that, that, you know, things like sentiment are not additive. And uh, what is the, the biggest advantage, in your opinion, of having a, a neural network dealing with text, assuming that there were an advantage, of course? Um, so one of the things that we talked about is that, you know, assuming you do have enough text, the model learns the optimal features, um, which is obviously, you know, pretty appealing uh, if you've worked on feature engineering before. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is that, you know, so I think that, you know, the way that Andrew Ng talks about this, um, you know, he, you know, his message is really that deep learning has become commercially viable. Um, because language is really complex, um, you know, images are really complex. And because of that, neural models are, are going to be increasingly optimal because they can scale complexity arbitrarily. Tra traditional models can't do that. You know, you, they can't, you can't make them more complex. They have hyperparameters. You can tune them. Um, they, but they face performance plateaus, you know, as you get more data. Um, neural models don't face those plateaus. Um, and so as more data become available, um, you know, deep learning becomes more and more commercially viable. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll be better and better. So, yeah, indeed, deep learning is doomed to improve. Now, is this, uh, <laughs> what sentiment would this be? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, when we talk about uh, text and machine learning, especially those who follow trends, uh, would immediately uh, feel like, okay, these guys are talking about chatbots. <laughs> At least this was the case a few months ago. Now, of course, we could dedicate an entire episode to chatbots, but I would really like to know your opinion about this relatively new trend. And um, so let me ask you, how did chatbot change the way data scientists look at text and conversations? Well, I think, you know, it might be helpful to sort of think about this from the perspective of a user, you know, because you, you said at the beginning, you know, we're, we're interacting with chatbots all day long. Um, you know, from a user perspective, chatbots are an incredibly important step towards solving this sort of interface challenge of human cognition and machine systems. Um, and I mean, if I had to choose between like filling out a boring form manually or chatting with a bot, um, you know, I'd go with the bot and from the backend perspective, you're hopefully getting the same or maybe even more data entered into the database um, as you would with the, the manual form filling out. But, you know, it takes out some of that interpretive struggle um, from the user. Uh, so I don't have to kind of work through the effort of figuring out which box to check and what you mean by this category or that category. I can just sort of answer questions naturally in the way that I think and talk. Um, and it kind of offloads the, the work of interpretation onto the bot. So, you know, but actually the work isn't really the, the work that the bot is doing. It's the work that the data scientist or the engineer is doing to sort of figure out how to encode that process of interpretation. Um, and really it comes down to the challenge of how do you capture the context, um, you know, not just the words. And, and when it's, you know, a, a dialogue um, or utterances, you know, the, the sequence matters um, and the history of the conversation matters. And so in order to, to program that, chatbots have to maintain state uh, throughout the course of the interaction, which is tricky. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was saying that like it's the most challenging part in in designing chatbots. It's not actually uh, classifying an intent or or uh, correcting some typos and and, and uh, doing spelling checking, but it's probably maintaining conversations, as you said. And uh, uh, the first versions of chatbots were merely classifying utterances to specific intents and provide or selecting almost randomly within, of course, a a cluster of related uh, uh, responses. They were providing these responses associated to the predicted intent, uh, which is basically, you know, the purists would refer to this task as, okay, this is text classification. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we go from a pure classification task to maintaining a conversation with humans? Yeah. So, I mean, the trick is <clears throat> you have to figure out a way to capture the context, right? So, so maintaining the state, um, capturing the context. So when we talked about text preprocessing, you know, when we broke down the documents, you know, full documents into their paragraphs, the paragraphs into the sentences, sentences into tokens, um, that preprocessing process allows us to put the words back into their context when we need to, when we need to understand. So in the context of the chatbot, you know, we can break the conversation down the same way, right? So a conversation is composed of a series of, you know, little dialogues, let's say, and from an object-oriented stand standpoint, you know, one dialogue uh, might have, you know, four methods, let's say. So it has maybe a listening method, it has a parsing method, it has an interpretation method, and then it has a response method. So that, with that framework for, you know, for a single little dialogue, um, like one back and forth, let's say, that lets us think about our con conversation as just a specialized dialogue, except it's one that contains maybe m multiple dialogues. Um, and so those different dialogues um, can handle different kinds of interpretations and responses, right? They can, um, they can implement uh, those methods differently. So there could be one for, for greetings, let's say, or one for goodbyes. There could be one for booking a ticket. There could be one for canceling a ticket. Um, you know, either way, the, those different dialogues are going to maintain separate internal states. They're going to remember different parts of the information that you can then recompose or um, uh, retrieve when you need. So then, like, for example, when the conversation listens and gets something like, hello, I'd like to book a ticket, um, you can pass that input into the internal dialogues. Um, and hopefully we've got a, a dialogue that implements like booking a ticket or booking flights. Um, and then, you know, it recognizes that that as a that kind of dialogue type and it can return the response with the highest confidence score, you know, which maybe in this case would be sure. When's your trip? Where are you headed? So it's a, a bit more like a divide and conquer uh, way to solving the problem. Exactly. Now, allow me to ask a more, let's say, philosophical question, <laughs> because chatbot technology is no longer new as it was booming in, if I remember well, 2015, 2016. And now it seems to me it's slightly faded out. What do you think about that? So, I mean, I think that's that's so interesting. And it's really true, you know, um, you think about kind of like the the first chatbot, like Eliza, um, you know, if if she were around now, she'd be, what, 50, <laughs> 52 years old. Um, so uh, chatbots have been around for a really, really long time. Um, of course, you know, modern chatbots are, are pretty different, right? So Eliza, um, you know, is completely deterministic. Um, and chatbots today can use sort of like a sleek combination of heuristics and machine learning to come up with, you know, ever better responses. And conveniently, they're also empowered by all of the user data that they've ingested and that they can ingest um, and that data enriches the context that they know about, um, you know, so they they can use information about where we are physically, you know, maybe our geo um, positional data um, for interacting with an app on our phone and our phone knows where we are um, or things that we have favorited or upvoted inside the application, you know, can use that information to enrich the context and give us better responses. Um, you know, although I will say, you know, you're right, like chatbots aren't sort of trending the way they were um, a few years ago. Um, but I think that if they're not trendy now, um, it's not because they've died out. 
but because they've just become so ubiquitous and you know the better they get the less we notice them <laughs> wow so we have been conquered <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Rebecca, it was great to have you here at uh, Data Science at Home. I hope our listeners enjoyed as much as I did asking uh, some of the most important questions about uh, text analytics and, of course, your book, Applied Text Analysis with Python. As always, the transcript and some of the references of this episode will be reported in the show notes at datascienceathome.com. Thanks very much for having me. This was, this was really fun. This episode is supported by CryptPad, the secure collaboration platform to edit your documents with colleagues and friends without compromising your privacy. No document can be read by the cloud or the NSA, not even CryptPad themselves. You can try it for free. For more, visit cryptpad.fr. C R Y P T P A D dot F R. This was Data Science at Home the podcast that makes machine learning and artificial intelligence easy for everyone. If you like the show, don't forget to write a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podbean. You can also find us on datascienceathome.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and get the latest updates. Thanks for listening. Hey, are you still there? Well, let me tell you about the newsletter of Data Science at Home. It's my free digest of the best content in artificial intelligence, data science, predictive analytics, and computer science. Subscribe now, datascienceathome.com.